Hello, I'm Candy McCabe. I'm a Florence Nightingale Foundation Chair of Clinical Nursing Practice Research here at UWE. This is a job that has a three-way partnership between UWE, the Royal United Hospitals NHS Foundation Trust and the Florence Nightingale Foundation. In my role at the Royal United Hospitals, I work as a consultant nurse for two days a week, leading two services in the area of chronic pain. In my role as a Florence Nightingale Foundation Chair, I work with a number of other chairs around the country and our remit is to raise the profile of nursing and specifically to promote academic clinical nursing research. Today I'm going to talk to you about chronic pain. We have all experienced pain at some point in our lives, but hopefully not many of you have ever experienced continuous unremitting pain. Pain that for some people lasts their lifetime. It's commonly fluctuating in nature and in quality and is always accompanied by emotional and physical distress. Chronic pain is defined as pain that lasts for more than 12 weeks, so around about three months and it's continued long after the time you'd expect an injury to have healed. That's why it's particularly confusing to patients, because often they feel that there is no obvious reason for them to still be feeling that pain. In our society, there's almost an acceptable face of pain. For example, this young footballer clearly has sustained an injury to his leg. And the reason for that pain and that obvious distress is clearly apparent to us all. However, injury does not always have to be present when you have chronic pain, and frequently it isn't. You may see somebody who expresses that they're in pain, but there's no obvious physical reason for them to have pain. This can be the most lonely and distressing aspect of chronic pain. An example of this type of pain is amputee phantom limb pain. So if a person has a limb amputated, nearly 90% of people will still feel as if the limb is there. A large percentage of those people will also report strange sensations that may include pain within that missing limb. It seems extraordinary that you can feel pain in something that is not part of your body. In fact, a space of vacant emptiness, and yet it's still painful to you. In historical times, these people used to be looked upon as mad, deluded, strange that they still experienced and reported pain. But now as science has moved forward and our clinical understanding and neuroimaging understanding of how phantom limb pain happens, we can start to understand that it's a process of altered brain mechanisms and altered nervous pathways that give us these bizarre sensations. Chronic pain can be broadly divided into two types of pain. So there's musculoskeletal pain, which emanates from bones or ligaments, is commonly experienced as a sharp pain. And then there's neuropathic pain, that nerve pain, People tend to report that this is burning in nature, maybe sharp and stabbing and feel like daggers. Of course, you may have both present together. So for example, somebody has fibromyalgia, a widespread chronic musculoskeletal pain type syndrome, but they may indeed still have neuropathic pain, perhaps from an old surgery injury. So different medications, different interventions will be used to treat these different sorts of pain. So why do we feel pain? What's the purpose of pain? Well, the aim is that it's there to keep you safe. It's there to alert the body to the fact that there may be something threatening approaching, or that indeed that the body's been injured and that you need to move away and find a safe place to either escape the potential harm or to protect yourself and give time for healing. 
Pain works very well in the acute injury setting because of course, if you have a fracture or a sprain or perhaps a burn, then you do need time to rest that area and let the body naturally heal itself. However, of course, if you have chronic pain, then pain is no longer as helpful. For example, if you have rheumatoid arthritis, that's usually a condition that may last a lifetime that will be present with pain on most days. You can hardly try and escape that. You can't find an easy solution to rest and cure that. And the problem is that if you feel as if you should be resting, not using those joints, then actually the muscles become weaker and you start to become less cardiovascular fit. And therefore we need to have different approaches to treat and identify acute and chronic pain. So let's now look at the differences between acute and chronic pain. In acute pain, the cause is usually known. People have often had trauma or they've had surgery, and there's an expectation about how long it'll take to heal. It may be that they've known other people who've had similar condition and understand how long it took them before they started to feel better. There's also an expectation that the most severe pain will be experienced at the time closest to that injury or surgery, and that over the weeks, as things heal, the pain should start to reduce. You'll know too that you should rest that painful area, protect it, not overdo things. And also because you'll be feeling tired, that's fine to rest. You'll be offered medication, and commonly that can be quite strong medication with acute pain, because it's known that you'll need it only for a short period, and then you'd move on to treatments that are lower down the WHO analgesic ladder and you'd start to slowly wean yourself off that medication. Because you've had an injury or surgery, then friends, family and employers will completely understand why you have pain. And similarly, expect that your behaviour will be a bit different. You might need more help than usual. And they'll be able and happy, generally, to give that additional support for that limited amount of time. However, if we now look at chronic pain, it's a bit of a different picture. Let's say you started off with a fractured wrist. You would have expected that by seven or eight weeks down the line, once the bone had healed, then that pain should have disappeared and everything should be fine. You should have started to slowly be moving that arm. But how is it that you still have pain in a limb that you know from the x-rays has all healed up? and you've still got persistent pain. You don't understand it, and you don't know why you've still got that pain. How is it being caused? You also don't know how long you're likely to have it. And indeed, in the scenario where we saw earlier of somebody with rheumatoid arthritis, they will get to know that actually there may be very few days when they're not experiencing pain, and that could be over their lifetime. There's also an unpredictable nature to that chronic pain. It can vary each hour or each day and fluctuate. You can't plan things around it. You'll also find that it, once again, you feel very tired because chronic pain takes up a lot of your brain's energy to be processing. But the more that you rest, the more deconditioned you become, the more secondary pain you start to get. You also may find that you can't be on high dose long-term medication because of the subsequent side effects. And that actually it may be very difficult to find a medication that makes a significant difference to your pain. And because you don't understand the pain, it's very difficult to explain to family, friends and employers why you still have pain. Maybe that when they look at you, they can see no obvious cause for that pain. And so they may start to doubt that you're actually experiencing it. And of course, it could be that you have chronic pain and then you get acute pain on top of that. So perhaps, for example, you have osteoarthritis and need to go and have a hip replacement. Then you will have long-standing chronic pain, perhaps in other joints unrelated to that hip, but now you've got acute pain on top of it. These become difficult to manage concurrently and they will need different approaches.
So how does chronic pain start to affect the individual? Well, of course, if you have a painful part of your body, you tend not to move it and therefore you become less physically active. It may be that you can no longer use an arm or a leg in the way that you used to do. Or perhaps if you have chest pain, that affects your confidence in coughing, in taking deep breaths, in being able to walk any distance because you start to ache everywhere. So there can be functional consequences, undoubtedly, of having chronic pain. But also, it will have an effect on your mental health. Living with chronic pain is exhausting and can be very depressing. Often people with chronic pain become anxious, depressed, uncertain of the future. They may start to lose self-confidence and no longer recognise themselves as the person that they used to be. It could be because of their pain. They can no longer work in the same family roles that they used to have. Perhaps as a dad and he's no longer able to play with his sons, he feels that he's not a proper dad, that he can't be playing football with his children. Often mums talk about having a problem of being able to fit their children into car seats or still being able to prepare meals for the family. That's something they identify as a mother. And not being able to do these things, people may report that they feel less of the person than they used to. It may also be that they have a change in their body image. Hmm. Perhaps this is because you need to have some aids to help you do things. Or perhaps use a walking aid in order to support yourself and to get around. Walking aids we associate with somebody who's perhaps older. And therefore, if you're a young person needing a walking stick or crutches, you can feel that you no longer look like your peers and become very self-conscious. Similarly, some people who have chronic pain, they start to hate the painful body area, feel that it doesn't belong to them, feel strange and alien to them. And again, this can affect how you socialise and how confident you are about exposing that body part in social situations. All of this can lead to a loss of independence. You may need more help to do physical activities, or indeed it may be that because you've lost confidence, you need a bit more support in order to go out and socialise with friends, or indeed just to get back and forth to work or to do your daily activities. And unfortunately, with a reduced physical activity, this can impact upon cardiovascular system and give a reduced life expectancy. Many people with chronic pain not only lose their roles within the home, but also lose their employment or stop being able to engage in education, school, university or further degrees. All of this can result in a change in role generally. So at a personal level, at a social level and at the community level. If you have chronic pain as well, your time may be spent with multiple appointments, hospitals, with your GP and also the financial pressures. If you're not able to work, that undoubtedly will have a financial impact. But of course, there's prescriptions to pay for, lots of painkillers to pay for, and the cost of not being able perhaps to drive, so having to take public transport. All of these things make a huge impact upon the individual. So we have to think about chronic pain in a holistic sense. I've already briefly alluded to the fact that pain and social isolation often come together. This can mean that a person with pain finds it too effortful to get up, to get dressed, to prepare themselves to go outside. Too effortful to explain to friends again that yes, they do still have pain, though there's nothing that their friends can see. And why do they have pain? And to get back into all those same repetitive conversations. And therefore it's much easier to just simply not meet with friends, to not go out. And once that starts to happen, then people lose confidence, of course, in their body image, their appearance. Often they find that weight gain comes associated with chronic pain, perhaps sometimes due to the medication, but often due to inactivity. And therefore, it isn't uncommon to see somebody with chronic pain who spends much of their time within the home. <laughs> to summarise. Chronic pain has biopsychosocial impact. So of course there's the sensory component, that perception of pain and other unpleasant sensations that are commonly experienced, such as an unpleasant itch, 
or ache or just general discomfort. There is the mental impact of anxiety, depression, the feeling of isolation. There's the behavioural impact. At the personal level, that may just be that an individual can no longer perform the same day-to-day -day functions that they used to be able to. But also, due to perhaps anxiety and depression, they may withdraw upon themselves and not wish to go out and about to see other people. There's the emotional impact, of course. Many people with chronic pain report that they're much more short-tempered. They find it difficult to be in busy surroundings, become intolerant of other people and struggle to be able to maintain conversations over a lengthy period. And all of this is set within the context of the social setting in which that individual sits. That may vary from different cultures about how the family cope with these problems. There may be different perceptions within the society in which that person is based. So it's always important to think about the person as an individual, the context which they sit in, in their personal situation, but also within their cultural context. All of these things will help you to decide what interventions are appropriate for this person as an individual. So how can we help people with chronic pain? Because there are indeed many ways that we can help. First of all, it's a complex and multifaceted problem that's influenced by internal and external factors. Therefore, we need to take a holistic approach, look at the person as a whole and understand the context in which they are living. We also, of course, need to relieve the pain as much as possible. Now that may be through medication, aids, devices, but it's unlikely that we're going to get rid of the pain completely. The main remit in the principles of pain management is to improve function, to get people to have the optimum function despite their pain. And so unlike in acute pain, where we ask people to rest and protect the painful area, in chronic pain, we want people to move and become active despite the pain. Therefore, we need to give lots of education and explanation of why chronic pain is still present and why people will do no harm by keeping active despite the pain. This takes specialist interventions and support and lots of advice in order to give the person confidence that they won't do harm. So we need to be able to reduce their disability and help people to see all the things that they can still do perhaps through a little bit of adaptation, changes. The only way that we can help someone to change is to give people the tools with which they understand and can action that change. So empowering people with plenty of education, lots of reassurance, and getting them to do things in the presence of therapists, nurses, so that they know that they won't break or fall apart if they're active. Of course, we have to give advice about how to pace their activities appropriately and balance that between rest and exercise. So commonly people will need to access a pain clinic or perhaps other specialist support that's appropriate to their particular condition. These are a few tips on how to help empower people to self-manage their pain. The first principle is absolutely involve patients in their care and help them plan their future care Plan that around their values, what's important to them, what are their preferences and priorities, and not ours as healthcare professionals. That will require some goal setting, and these need to be realistic goals. Probably there's going to be some short-term goals, and then some longer-term things that people are wishing to aim for. That could be as simple as being able to go out once a week to get to start to see friends again, and then, so how are you going to achieve that? That may just be that it's a matter of going outside the house, down to the end of the garden, starting off from that point of view, and then building up slowly to being able to check out a cafe, make sure that the access is possible for you, and just meeting a good friend for a coffee, before slowly building up to perhaps going out for an evening for dinner. 
very small set goals which can be achieved, which give people confidence as they gradually build up their activities. And of course, because you have pain and you're tired, then you need to pace those activities accordingly. And so giving people advice about how to do little and often, but absolutely to still keep active, even on the days when the pain is bad. Patients commonly find it much easier to be taught these techniques through the likes of self-management programmes or in talking to nurses and other healthcare professionals. There's a whole range of management programmes for pain around in the UK. These can be condition specific or they may be more generic. And so it's always useful for you as a nurse to be aware of the different options available to patients. As part of your programme today, you were invited to have a look at this booklet before you came to this session. This was put together by myself and colleagues for Arthritis Research UK to help people who live with long-term chronic pain. Arthritis Research UK were finding that they were getting lots of phone calls from patients who were saying, I've tried everything. I've been back to the doctor. He says there's nothing more they can do for me. I've tried all these different medications and I'm still in exactly the same place as I have been for years. What can you do to help? So colleagues and I created this booklet to give some advice, direction and support to people who will have long-term pain. And indeed that pain may be for life. It's meant as a self-help guide and there are particular sections in there that you may find very helpful to inform your practice. In particular, I'd really recommend section two which is about the psychological aspects of pain and how people can be taught to live with pain and still be active. It's quite a difficult concept to get your head around. Colleagues and I have also done some research going to ask patients who have chronic pain what advice they would give to other patients who have pain. And through the interviews that we conducted, we found that the centre of what they wanted was to feel in control. And in order to help them feel in control, they needed to have acceptance of their condition. They needed to be getting the right support and they needed to be as informed as they could be. So our patients told us about acceptance. I suppose the first thing I'd say to patients is try not to constantly explain to people what you've got. When people say to you, how are you? Just say, I'm fine, thanks, how are you? This is a real common problem that patients with chronic pain have. They don't want to get into long explanations about why they still have pain. And sometimes they themselves don't quite understand it. So it's how to have a technique to get around that first introductory conversation and not become completely focused and define themselves by their pain. So that they can get past that first introduction and move on to the things that are much more interesting to them and more important. Our patients suggested that you need to get to the point where you're no longer looking for a cure and you're not letting the pain run your life. If people are constantly backward looking and trying to think about why do they have pain? How can they get rid of it? Who should they next go and see? Then again, pain is the dominant aspect in their lives and they're not being able to enjoy other daily activities. As I've mentioned before, pain always comes with an emotional consequence. And we need to recognise that. We need to allow people to mourn their well-being, mourn the well person that they thought they would be. And that there will be tough days and that people should be allowed to be able to cry and be comforted by other people. When it comes to getting the right support, our patients also had some good advice. They said it's important that you've got the right people to talk to, that there is someone that you can share living with chronic pain with and that they'll understand. A few of our patients said that it's their GP, their family doctor, who they need to have a particularly good relationship with because they're going to come back and forth very frequently they'll need those regular prescriptions updating. It also may be that they want referral to a different specialist area, that they'd like the GP to be aware of any new medications on the market or perhaps of new potential treatments. 
And what they didn't want to do is have to keep repeating the same story over and over again. They also felt that it would be helpful if there was a wider support network. Sometimes people with chronic pain like to just talk to other people with chronic pain. They absolutely understand the situation. And that you usually need a combination of friends and healthcare professionals who understand your problems and will be there for you when you need support. The third aspect that our patients said about helping them to feel in control was being informed. The things they said here were about getting as much information as they could to read up about their particular condition, try and get a good source of understanding, talk to other people who experience the same situation. So people are keen to access that good high quality information. Conversely though, there's a vast amount of information out on the internet, isn't there? And some of that can be really scary. Some of that too can also be inaccurate. So it's really important that if you're recommending to one of your patients to go and look at a website, that you're confident that that is high quality information. But also people want information at different times. And it may be that when you're first starting out with chronic pain, you really don't want to know that you've got this for life, that this is a lifelong scenario that you're going to have to adjust your working patterns to, your physical activities to. So sometimes people want a little bit of information at the beginning and then slowly have it fed to them as and when they need it. Often in the internet, you get the worst case scary scenarios. So take care and have a look before you recommend a website and check out that you would be confident that this would be a safe and comfortable thing for people to view. There's also something about understanding your illness enough so that people can tailor that information to themselves. Because as this person says, everybody's different. And therefore as nurses, it's really important, just as I said earlier, that you think holistically. Think about that individual, their particular circumstances. What is it that they need? How is it that they can best self-manage their pain? And that's going to be different for each person. So the last few slides have looked at what the person in pain feels would be helpful to them. But of course, pain doesn't just affect the individual who's experiencing that pain. It will undoubtedly affect those people who are close to that person, who are living in a close proximity to them. So their family, relatives, friends. So what do carers think is their role? How easy or difficult is it to be a carer when you're living with somebody who has chronic pain. Colleagues and I collected information from people who were caring for those who had chronic pain. We conducted qualitative interviews and this was led by Alison Lauder. The data that she presented, she did thematic analysis on, and these were the top things that carers talked about in terms of their experiences. What they said was that actually it's a really difficult job. In particular, it's a fine line between encouraging somebody to look after themselves, to do the things that the clinicians have recommended to them, versus seeing the impact of that on the family member. So what they don't want to do is be a nag, but they do want to be able to encourage them. But this is a real challenge. Similarly, they also said that it's a difficult balancing act between pushing somebody to be active and to be doing things that they should be when perhaps the person who they love is actually struggling to take on board any of this information and doesn't want to do it on that particular day. I'm sure that you can all quite understand how awkward it may be if you're aware that it's been recommended that the person should get up at the same time each day, go to sleep each day, that they shouldn't overdo activities during the day, but should pace their activities. And then you find that your relative actually wishes to do something different and doesn't seem to follow that advice. And yet you see that they're not getting better. It is very difficult and we need to support carers in that challenging job. One of the ways that we can help patients to lead a full life is to get them to shift their focus away from the pain. 
If you now just put your index finger right in front of your face, so line it up with your nose, how much of the room can you see? It's not going to be much, is it? Because mainly what you can see is your index finger. Now move that finger just over so that your finger's now adjacent to the shoulder. Now how much of the room can you see? You should be able to see the whole room uninterrupted. If we use this analogy with pain, what we say to our patients is, just imagine that that finger is your pain. Pain is completely consuming the whole of your life. That's all that you think about, what you talk about, and it rules what you'll do each day. If you can move pain so that you're sitting alongside you, just as you've moved your fingers to sit alongside you by your shoulder, pain's still present. Those people who know you, your family, clinicians caring for you, they absolutely know you have pain. But now you can start to function despite that pain. Because if we wait to start activities and engaging in life again until the pain has gone, that very rarely happens. We don't have a cure for chronic pain. Therefore, we have to encourage people to lead a full life despite that pain. And that's very much what pain management programmes are focused on, helping people to function despite the pain and helping them to understand that by doing that, they will do no harm. Pain in the chronic pain setting is no longer an alert and a useful reminder that actually they shouldn't be exercising. It's become a complication. It's stopping them from doing what they should do. Therefore, we have to effectively sidestep the pain and start to do activities despite it. In summary, there are very significant differences between acute and chronic pain in terms of our assessment of pain, our expectations and the individual's expectations, and how we treat and manage those symptoms. It is entirely possible to have both sorts of pain at one time. Often people who go for joint replacement surgery, maybe just one particular joint that's a problem, but commonly they might have osteoarthritis in many joints that are painful, but they're just going for perhaps a single hip joint replacement. They will have chronic pain related to their long-standing osteoarthritis, and then they'll have the acute post-surgical pain. I hope from this presentation that you've recognised that pain, of course, is an utterly subjective experience. None of us can ever know what it feels like for another person to be experiencing pain. Who are we to say that somebody is or is not in pain? It's really important that as nurses, you believe a person who says they have pain. Pain is something that is manifested by the body itself. There's a very close interaction between body and mind, and you cannot differentiate between what you might think is real pain or not pain. Crucially, just believe a patient when they tell you they have pain. And I hope you've seen from this presentation that we need to take a holistic nursing approach to the assessment and the care of these individuals because there is very much a biopsychosocial impact.